So, uh, 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 Dr. Deb Carr uh, is the innovation partner for the uh, Scotland branch of the Defence and Security Accelerator DASA, uh, materials engineer by training. Uh, Deb has worked on impact armour and PPE, um, particularly body armour, helmets, um, uh, wound ballistics, which I imagine probably means you've seen some fairly horrible pictures in your, uh, in your career, um, and forensic science. Uh, Deb is going to uh, lead the panel on uh, sharing the journey towards success, and this is part looking back at uh, past efforts of uh, academia and industry engagement. Deb, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Good morning, just good morning. Um, we're the last session between you and lunch. Um, I'm going to ask the panel members to introduce themselves first, and I've given them a little challenge to ask them to describe what their current interaction is with defence um, to date, and then we'll, we'll move on to the questions. So while they're introducing themselves, please do think about questions, and the same to, to our online um, panels as, as panel listeners as well. So thank you very much, Ed. Uh, thanks, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Group Captain Ed Watkin. I'm Deputy Head Space Support from UK Space Command. My re remit covers comms and engagement, workforce de development and growth, training policy uh, and operational support. Um, as you all know, uh, space-related activity was once solely the preserve of uh, governments, but today industry and academia uh, are driving growth in the, the space sector. And as a result, you know, defence will increasingly have to, uh, to, to reach out and partner. The Defence Security and Industrial Strategy aims to establish a more productive and strategic relationship between government and the defence and security industries. And from the Defence uh, Space Strategy, there are a number of cross-cutting principles which you've probably already heard in the OWN Collaborate uh, and uh, Access. From a, a command point of view, uh, UK Space Command epitomises the whole force construct. It's staffed by personnel from all three services, the civil service and industry. Uh, we recognise the importance of the commercial space uh, capability providers. The UK Space Operations Centre has a commercial integration cell uh, that enables better information flow to support operational requirements and protect UK interests. Again, in the Space Operations Centre, the Aurora programme uh, has seen wider collaboration on an agile basis. Specifically with a partner, we've embedded personnel into the centre to work with the team and fully understand the issues and requirements of those doing the job. This facilitated the st streamlining of the partner's understanding of the requirements, environment and pressures and ensured rapid assessment and resolution of issues, access and workflows. From a training perspective, we've just conducted a training and needs analysis of the defence-based workforce. This was delivered by an industry partner, but included widespread engagement with industry and academia, including specific academic working groups. As a result, we've been able to glean best practice from across the uh, these space education and training providers, and that's led us to deliver a course catalogue for defence. The TLA also delivered a competence framework and recommendations to modify our existing training courses and suggest some new ones. From a higher education perspective, we just started sponsoring two part-time PhDs, again, with the help from academia. Further TNA follow-on activity is just about to get underway with the redevelopment of our Pinnacle Expert Level Qualified Space Instructors course. We're also then redeveloping the Foundation Space Operations course for the awareness level. The most exciting aspect, though, is the development of the Space Academy. Um, this will absolutely be a partnership with the industry and academia. Some initial fact finding has been underway over the last few months, and we're just drafting a statement of requirements, and there will be an in invitation to tender going out later this year. Thank you very much, Ed. My name's Colin White. I'm a research fellow at Strathclyde University. I'm, I'm Dr. White. I'm not professor, as that screen says. I haven't suffered that indignity yet. <laughs> um, I, my main interests are in high-power RF, so I come really from a background of looking at things in space. Um, the devices that we develop are used as the last stage in, uh, in radar. Um, so we work from, uh, the, the ranges in radar for space are very high, so we work with very high powers. We also do work at the further extremes of powers up where it gets really stupid, which is in directed energy weapons, so I have a perspective on that as well. Um, through my career, I've done numerous uh, MOD and DSTL funded projects, some of which have been technical demonstrators. For my sins, I've been project manager on a number of projects at the tens of millions of pounds. Um, so I, I uh, sort of cross over a bit between the, the physics side, the engineering, I, mean, I work experimentally, so the engineering to actually get it to work, 
and also a little bit of that unpleasant organisational stage. Thank you. Hi, good, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Cawthorn. I'm the Director of Business Development and Sales at uh, Surrey Satellite Technology, uh, or uh, SSTL. Um, we are a specialist manufacturer in, in small satellites. I think, actually, uh, Anu did a much better introduction for SSTL earlier uh, than, than I will do now. But uh, I think you know, the, the point that, uh, that he was making there was that, uh, we, if I'm not, not too bold, we, we, under the leadership of uh, Sir Martin Sweeting, did uh, maybe invent small satellites or maybe the, the small satellite approach uh, 40 years ago. Um, or I think it's, uh, as somebody recently said, we, we were seen as the, uh, the original new space renegade. So uh, we have been very much trying to, uh, to innovate and, uh, and change uh, how space has been done uh, for, for over 40 years now. Um, I think, though, uh, you know, as all new space companies, we do have to, uh, to grow up. And from our University of Surrey roots, we were then acquired by uh, Airbus Defence and Space. Uh, and for the last 15 years, we have been, uh, we have been working as a, a subsidiary of, of Airbus. But I, I think uh, I'd like to say that we have uh, maintained the fleetness of foot again that, that Anu uh, referenced earlier. Um, we have been very much uh, kind of left to, uh, to our own devices to make sure that we don't lose the very things that, that Airbus acquired us for in, in, in the first place. We're working across a, a very broad range of things. We've just started our first uh, lunar mission. Uh, we're doing a couple of missions for climate-related uh, science. Uh, and of course, in, in defense, uh, most recently, the, uh, the, the project we've just started, uh, Taiki, uh, for, for Space Command. Which, which builds on the work that we did with, uh, with the Carbonite spacecraft uh, now to, uh, to deliver a sub one meter uh, ISR capability. Um, but of course, before that, we have done uh, numerous bits of work with, uh, with the STL and, and Air Command as we have helped to develop the space capability in the UK. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sean Sutcliffe. I'm the Chief Executive of Oxford Space Systems. And we're an SME, one of the ones that Alex was talking about earlier, venture capital backed including investment from uh, the National Security Strategic Investment Fund uh, early this year alongside of other investors, um, about four million. And what they're looking to do and we're looking to do is really accelerate uh, new technologies, new ideas for deployable antennas, uh, where obviously a lower mass, lower stowed weight mean you can get higher performance uh, for, for lower cost, which is what every customer wants. Um, I suppose in terms of uh, our interactions uh, with defence, we work with a, a number of uh, governments, uh, uh, some published, some not, uh, around the world with a particular market pull uh, on, on SAR, low Earth orbit SAR systems, uh, where people are looking for particular capabilities that can augment the you know, growing commercial data sets that they can get. Uh, and, and I suppose, hopefully, we're going to have a discussion, a couple, a couple of things that I note uh, around our uh, interactions with defence. You know, I've, I've worked in a range of sectors, including defence. First of all, um, how we can... We've got some fantastic ideas, but there's a bit of, bit of a disconnect between what we're capable of doing and what we understand as the mission need. And I know there's reasons why that might be so, but how can we make it easier for uh, innovations to find their way to market in the defence realm from an SME like ourselves? Uh, and the second is, and everybody knows this, you know, getting stuff on orbit, proving stuff, opens up new opportunities. You know, we've got a fantastic range of, I don't know, let's call them spin-out products from our, our core wrap rib uh, antenna, which is a fantastic, if you come down to Harwell, uh, I'll welcome you to have a, have a look at what you can um, and what you're allowed to look at. Um, but it's an absolutely fantastic product, but I've got a lot of spin-out activities which once we get stuff into space which we haven't yet with that particular product will accelerate how can we uh, accelerate uh, within an offense environment these uh, product developments so we if you like use the agility in new space uh, for our defense customers so those are perhaps two themes we'll come back to i'm sure we will sounds good um hello i'm doug little i'm the ceo of InSpace. Um, just a brief recap on, on sort of why I feel very passionate about defense space. I started uh, in the early 90s um, a, an organization called the DRA, 
I recognise a few people here that were actually in the DRA with me. Um, and that was because I went to a university careers fair and there was a poster up and it showed a picture of a couple of satellites called STRV 1A and B that this company called, this organisation, government agency called DRA, was building. And that's when I realised, wow, I can do space in the UK. And I joined DRA, which then became DARA, and then, you know, 2001 became um, DSTL and Kinetic, and split in part, uh, in half. And actually, you know, and following that journey through in the work we did at DARA on things like the Skynet program supporting Skynet 4 and then the Skynet 5 requirements and then building TopSat um, was absolutely, you know, fantastically inspiring to see uh, UK Defence getting so engaged in, in satellites and understanding what they could get from satellites. And then there was this really big dry period, I think, you know, in terms of what, what was happening with DSTL. And there was still some research going on, but, you know, the department really sort of downsized and became a much smaller player. So I'm delighted to see what, you know, under, under Michael Callahan's leadership, what we're seeing now in terms of that regrowth. Because, you know, I ended up doing commercial space at Surrey Satellites with Andrew uh, for, a, for many years from 2001 to 2015. And we did things like Galileo, um, JVA, the first demonstrator of, of, the, of the European Galileo system, um, did the world, not Wales, that's, that's a bit bold, did the UK's first CubeSat while we were there. Um, and then I eventually um, started in space missions in 2015. And there it was, you know, it was very much, you know, as, as Andrew would say, we we all have this thread leading back to Martin Sweeting. And you'll see a number of organizations uh, in the UK. You, know, you could look at Clyde Space, you could look at my company, uh, a few others that, you know, around the world and what sprung up with CubeSats that actually all lead back to a, a chap in Guildford who thought, hang on, I can do this differently. Um, and you know, we've taken that spirit and we're taking, you know, we take a different approach to Surrey Satellites, um, equally valid. Uh, and we're looking at clever ways to get things into space, whether it be physical payloads by putting multiple payloads on a single satellite, which kind of led to us devising, you know, with DSTL and, and Airbus, uh, the, uh, the Prometheus 2 missions, which we've heard about a few times today and yesterday, uh, and then also put us in a great position to then win the Titania mission for free space optical comms, which we're building at the moment and uh, planning to launch next year. And the other thing that we're really looking at is, um, as I say, we're trying to find cunning ways to get things up um, quickly and cheaply and, and try and short circuit some of the huge capex requirements and huge schedules to get stuff in space. Uh, we're also looking at software-defined satellite. I mean, a lot of companies are. We think we've got quite a unique way of doing that and also how we can upgrade satellites in orbit physically as well as in software. Um, we've got some interesting IP that's being developed there. And I have to mention that last September we were acquired by BAE Systems, so I can't call myself an SME anymore or a startup or any of these things um, because now we're owned by one of the big boys. Um, and, you know, we're very excited to see where the future leads now because also, you know, uh, there was a certain romantic romanticism to having BAE Systems coming to talk to us because, you know, as I was growing up, it was British Aerospace that did you know, most of the space in the UK and, you know, built things like the Giotto mission, which was one that massively inspired me in the 80s, you know, going to, going to a, a comet. And uh, here they are again re-entering space. And so we're going on that journey with them. And uh, it's going to be an exciting time, I think, for the next few years. Thank you very much all. So what a fantastic panel you've got. We've got, obviously, the end user. We've got an academic. We've got businesses at different stages of growth that have come out of academia and have been acquired by large companies. So here's a great opportunity for us to share some of the journeys. So let's start off with an audience question, shall we? Who has a, a question for somebody in the panel? Don't be shy. I'm not letting you go to lunch until you've asked questions. <laughs> you think I'm joking, don't you? Don't know me. No? Thank you. Uh, the microphone's just come oh. to... Hello, Rick. <laughs> I was on the STRV mission as well. I forgot about that. <laughs> um, touch upon it, the question touched upon it with Mike O'Callaghan, um, the, the value of death thing in terms of uh, research getting into operational capabilities and contracts. And it was not so much the value of death where funding runs out. What I'm interested in, in any of your thoughts of that we've always had a dilemma in the UK, I think, between 
research, where research happens with small companies or R&D or scientific community, and then the procurement and commercial organisation takes over, and then we have to have a competition for something, but then how do you exploit that research that has been done by company X? So how do you get company X research and IP involved via a competition to then build something operationally? Who would like to have a go at that one? That's, that's a minefield, isn't it? I mean, I could see it being answered from, from all three sectors, to be perfectly honest with you. Do you want to go from the customer end first? Um, I think... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> Throw me under the bus. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is, is down to you know, communication uh, and, and you know, us understanding our, our own requirements, where those gaps are, um, and then you know, reaching out to, to industry at the appropriate time. Uh, whether that's through Mike uh, or, or through our own cap area. So I think you know, that, that two-way communication is, is the key, and I think that's greatly improved since the, the start-up of the command, you know, events such as this, and, and that's, that's where I see things uh, improving, I think. Can we go academic next? Oh, I, I had one project that, that did run that, that went for a technical demonstrator, so it was TRL3 going, trying to go to four to five, and it died, and it deserved to die. Um, uh, and the, the thing that killed it was um, the understanding of the main contractor didn't understand well what the customer really needed and all of the aspects of his, um, uh, all the aspects of, of the requirements and the, all the ones that were needed understood some of them but not all of them and the one that it didn't understand resulted in the presentation at the, for going forward and funding that essentially killed it. Um, so my, my thing with that is that you, you really do have to understand, you really have to listen to the customer. And um, it, it's essential to, to understand all of what their priorities are. Because if you miss one, you're going to go. And I mean, it's true, the valley of death is the valley of death for a reason. Many of things that go into the valley of death don't deserve to come out the far end. So some do and, and don't get the funding. So it, it's important that there is sufficient funding at that TRL3 level to make sufficient progress, because if there's not enough in there to make the progress, you're going to die anyway. Um, but uh, it's important that you're really going into it, that you've got the right targets. Gentlemen, your thoughts? Happy to say, I mean, I think some of the examples, you know, the, the sort of the way Rick was framing the question, uh, I see this as, the, the, there's a part of this where industry funds its own research, um, and then, you know, DSTL or MOD come along and say that's really interesting, but then feels they have to compete the program. Um, I think we need to be really careful around that. We need to look at how we can um, actually support and, and form strategic partnerships between industry and, 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 uh, and the agency. Uh, that there are areas where we, you know, we'll, where you'll actually get better engagement from industry if industry can see that at the end of the fundamental or the lower TRL research, that there's a program waiting for them, if they can do it. Um, and you'll, you'll often get that industry will co-invest and come along on that journey, uh, which means that actually you stand a much better chance of, of vaulting the valley of death because you've got that skin in the game that means industry wants to make it happen and they'll often then fund some of those interim valley of death stages and they'll go and demonstrate those technologies in orbit and move, nudge it up towards TRL 6-7 so it's ready to be turned into something operational. You know, and those are, you know that's, that's, that's a very exciting relationship. It doesn't lend itself to a competition. So if you know, we want to look at competitive programs, there's, I think, you know, MOD needs to look at how they 100% fund that early work and then create a level playing field. I mean, I know that when we won the Titania mission from InSpace Missions, we actually hadn't done the precursor work, but the way the competition was designed, it was a very fair playing and level playing field that allowed all of us to bid for it. You know, and we were, that was very exciting for us because it actually gave us a chance to, to you know, and it stimulated us as a, a new small prime in the UK, and that wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been a competitive process. So it's that balance, you know, when industry wants to come with you, you know, encourage them, get them to invest, but you know, accept they then have to come with you as a partner. Um, and if you're gonna fund it fully, that's fantastic as well. Um, 
and you will, you might stimulate yet another prime or another equipment provider or you, you know whatever. You know, I wear another hat for under the UK space trade body. I chair the SME committee. We have a large. We have got over sixty SMEs in UK space at the moment, and. They all, you know, pretty much to a man, want to see a competition wherever possible. They want a chance to be able to form partnerships with primes, you know, when they're in the supply chain. They want a chance to show how their really exciting, innovative, cool new technology that might have been funded by VCs or, or internally funded, how they can bring that to market. And you need to keep creating that environment where you've got, on one hand, industry investing, and on the other hand, you've got these competitive processes. Absolutely. Sean, Andrew, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yes, I, I probably do. So, so, so I think, uh, I mean, first of all, just to draw experience from, from other sectors, you know, often if you're looking to invest at a demonstrator, you want a contract with your customer to assure the market. Well, that's not unfortunately possible in this case. So that means you have to equity fund uh, uh, such a, such a, um, a, a mission now, from our point of view, we've raised some equity to do exactly that, but we need to find a partner who will equity fund the other bit of it. Um, so to do that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's two or three things we can do. First of all, get the cost down. Let's not make, if it's for defence, let's make it a, a much cheaper demonstrator so the bill isn't so high. Uh, that means not putting all the bells and whistles on, frankly speaking. <laughs> Secondly, you need to make the case as to why it, you, it makes sense, uh, you know, are you going to save time on a program? You're going to find things out early, you know, the fundamental problems, which in a more traditional program you'll probably find out, but maybe, you know, 100 million pounds later. Um, so, so, so I think that's important. And thirdly, you know, you, you do have to have confidence in the overall market, which means understanding the mission, what your customers need, and therefore having further insights in, into their market. But there's investor appetite to do this, absolutely. Um, if you can do it. The only other thing I'd say is, you know, I used to work for a you know, mid-sized oil and gas company. We had exploration budget, I don't know, a few hundred million pounds a year. You know, you drill a well, 25% chance of success, it would be 10, 20 million pounds. You know, you have to, you have to sink some money into these things. I think, yeah, I think uh, the only thing I'd add really is that, um, you know, there's, there's room for, for different models here and we can't, or we shouldn't expect that there would be one rigid procurement model that works for all scenarios. Um, and yes, in some cases, if, the, if there is IP in industry that the uh, MOD wants to, to access, then, then maybe there, is a, there has to be a different approach to, to working with that organization than uh, you know, the, the, the standard going out to compete things. But at the same time, there is a place for that. And as Doug says, it, it, there needs to be the opportunity for those things to happen. So it just requires you know, different horses for different courses, I think. So from an online perspective, um, I'm really interested, and I'm sure many of my defence colleagues are as well, what do we do that's good at the moment in terms of engaging with you, helping you with this communication issue, for example, so as you understand the problem, what do we do this bad? How can we learn? We know we don't do it all right, so how can we get better at it? Andrew, Sean, maybe we'll start with the two of you first. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think, um, I think it's useful to understand the, con the, the context behind that, really, because, you know, uh, space and the defence space, uh, you know, okay, outside of Skynet is relatively new mm. in the UK. Um, and... Uh, and so coming into that, you know, we've got organisations like, like SSTL. We are, you know, we are experts at what we do. We have been building small satellites for, for more than 40 years. Um, but we don't know too much about how the defence world works because it's not something we've had too much experience with. On the other side of things, you know, MOD is absolutely expert at what, what they do. Uh, and, and they've been doing that successfully for a lot longer than, than, than we have. But, uh, but perhaps don't know too much about procuring small satellites. Uh, and, and that's where a kind of collaborative approach I is absolutely required because we are, both sides here are, are, are learning. They're both sides are expecting to learn from the other and, and to try and uh, solve the problem uh, more collaboratively. And, and I think what, what we've experienced you know, recently on, on Taiki was that that was absolutely the, the, uh, the, the way that the teams approached that, that problem. Uh, we have worked very well together to, okay, within some constraints, of course, that there are, there are constraints, but to look at the problem and, and, and pragmatically figure out how we can get to a solution that, that works for both sides. So I was, I was very encouraged that, that you know, the, you know, some of the rigidity that we had 
perhaps expected wasn't there when we were, were going through that uh, through that process. Um, I guess you know, well, in terms of what what doesn't work so well, and I mean, it, it nevertheless took a very long time, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know, it, it would be great if we can find a way to make that process a little a, a little faster, um, and and on top of that, of course, because of the way that the MOD works and, and rotates people around in, in different roles. We, we just get to a position where we have got a good understanding and, and we've both educated each other on, on how this should be working and what we need to do next. Uh, and then our, our MOD counterpart moves on to a new role and we get somebody coming in who's, who doesn't know anything about it. Or, or you know, uh, So that, that, that can make the process a little trickier. Sure. Well, I think, I mean, on, on the good side, you know, we've got much more clarity now about what uh, the UK government wants in terms of its space strategy. We've seen all the documents. We have great access. We, you know, I hope other people do as well to, to Marco Callaghan, to Harv, to Goddard and all the team. So, you know, we absolutely get good clarity on, on uh, what our customers are looking for, um, what its trade-offs are, you know, within the constraints of what they can tell us. And, and therefore expectations. And I think there's a recognition, uh, as, as, as you were saying, Andrew, that this is collaboration. It's not all about you know, competition as such. And, and, and in a way, the investment we've had from, from NSIF recognises that the UK is trying to build up a strategic capability, mm. maybe picking winners. Thank you if, if you pick me. You know. um, but, but nonetheless, which we can then use to help our partners around the world, which is what we're doing. And, and, and the collaboration that the MOD has with its Five Eyes partners, for example, in SAR, is something that we can help with as well. So that's on the plus side. On, 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 the, on the negative side, this is the point I was making earlier, is I'm sure we can do so much more. If, if I had you know, access to all the top secret understanding of all the missions, and don't, you know, please, I'm, you know, I've not got the vetting, so um, don't give it to me. Um, I, or, or more precisely, if our, if, if our you know, really clever engineers did, I'm sure they can think of ways that we can help the mission requirements. That the, the chain between the user and what we can do is too long and too sort of obscure to, to maximise potential. Um, so, so, you know, and, and, and we were talking about with Mike the other, the other day about this, how we can, you know, within the, the unfortunate constraints we have, uh, unlock that potential in the UK, speed it up, unlock it. We'd put money in. We'd put equity into doing because it, it's relatively cheap at that end of the, you know, mm. uh, that sort of TRL. There must be much more we can do. Yeah. Let's take an academic perspective. Oh, the, the obvious one is DASA is great. I would say that. I've got Thank money you. out of it. Yeah. Um, I'm not just sucking up to the chair. Um, <laughs> Serapis, uh, less good, more difficult, more work. Uh, for us to get things funded and critically it hits a problem that we have in the universities in that there's often a delay between starting it and getting the funding through and it might only be a few months but I should dispel some myths about academics we're not all in secure jobs yeah our employment contracts have completely changed since most of the people are at university I am on a contract with an end date and I have been since 1996 so for the first several years, I was entirely dependent on someone bringing money in since then. Now that's my job, bringing money in for other people, but also bringing the money in for myself. So these, one, these several months gaps have a huge effect. And what you find is that these people often have options outside of what you're doing. And so what happens is you just lose them. They go to somewhere else. They go and work on something else. They've got transferable skills. So. That's a difficulty. Um, the last thing is, is that this, this thing going on from DASA, um, and if it's to be open and competed, there, there are intrinsic problems in that because by the time you've got to that point, you've got IP issues. Mm. Universities are voracious on IP. They're not going to let anything go. My university, Strathclyde, is, or at least it was, the third biggest earner for patents outside Oxford and Cambridge. And that principally comes from beta blockers. But understandably, it therefore has a focus on making sure that it holds the IP that it paid its people to generate. And it's not going to let those go. So um, there needs to be a way 
and an acceptance of, of what the IP situations are going to be and that you're going to have to, unfortunately, you're going to have lawyers in there and it's going to be painful and you're going to have to work very hard to get it through. That's very interesting. The longevity of the contracts and the delay, obviously I'm very familiar with being an ex-academic. Um, I hadn't thought about the IP issue. I think that's really interesting, actually. We are a very strange group, and even within Strathclyde, and mm. the, in fact that we have that longevity, and that we and my academic superiors and, and they have engineered a way to keep people employed. Um, there are other people who don't, who just let the people go and accept that they've got to bring people in new. So it's, it's horses for courses. It's uh, how you choose to manage it. I'm curious to know what the customer thinks we do well and do bad. I've got my own personal opinions. So I, I think the good news is everyone has got a central point of contact to go to now in, in the yeah. command. Uh, you know, the commander has you know, his, his own capability area mm -hmm. and the command and his own budget. So I think from that point of view, that simplifies things to an extent. I think to, to Andrew's point on turnover of personnel, I think that will become less of an issue going forward. You know, space won't necessarily have its own career field you know, in the immediate future. But what we'll probably see is, is people come and do a tour in space you know, go out, do uh, you know, something within branch because we don't have a, a space specific branch yet, but come back. So you get that, that longevity then of, of you know, knowledge and understanding that hopefully will then, then pass across to, uh, to uh, partners. So I think that, that, that's certainly where we're aiming. And again, the partnership we're looking with the, uh, the academy and how we take that forward and longer term kind of educational partnerships as well. Again, I think it's going to be key to again, bring out that knowledge base you know, within defence. Uh, to make us better, better customers. Thank you very much. Do we have another question from the audience? There's a few more online, but I'd like to give anyone an opportunity to ask a question from the audience. Down here, please, could you have a microphone? I'll step out your way so as you can see the panel. Hi there, uh, Tim Robinson, Aerospace Magazine. Um, question really for uh, Andrew and Doug. Uh, advice for space startups that are being courted by the big primes and um, you know with the amount of innovation uh, startups catapults vcs uh, you name it uh, dragon's den is it now easier for, for kind of space companies with innovative uh, you know ideas to kind of go it alone who wants to go first i'm happy to go on doug um having just been through the the the, the fun and the pain of being acquired. Um, yeah, so it's um, certainly, I mean, we did it without actually taking any VC investment or any equity investment. Um, we were able to, as a small company, because of the environment we're working, because of the ideas we'd had and the, the business that we were growing, to actually build the company off revenues. Um, and then with some loans, you know, which was fun because they were secured against my house. Um, and, you know, through that period, um, Actually, we we found that that was an that was an okay way to grow the company, and it meant that we were able to grow the company fairly cautiously. But you know, and then at the point when we felt we wanted to pull the trigger on the explosive growth, we were then able to then start the engagement with investors, and we went for a corporate investor straight away. Um, we that was that was the route we wanted to go down. We were very keen that we wanted to go with somebody that understood what we were trying to do as a business that would allow us to work across the sector, um, and we wouldn't get tied into a very single singular business plan. So I think you know it, it is it is possible now, and I, I think we're in a better position. You know, you you can look around at the number of you know every six months one of the small companies gets acquired by one of the primes, uh, and you know, whether it's a smaller prime like AAC buying Clyde. Or you know you have uh, Lockheed taking out you know a, a chunk out of Tyvek and et cetera et cetera and and you know m many years ago now actually Airbus having the prescience to buy Surrey satellites and now BAE coming in with us so it's been um, I think it's a good time to do it um, it's a great time to grow a company at the moment and you know in terms of the role defence plays in that keep doing what you're doing have a clear plan. Um, and communicate that plan, which actually through Space Director and Space Command you're doing now, which is just brilliant, um, because it means that we can plan, we can plan against that, we can make decisions on internal investment, and we can also then go and engage with people like BAE Systems, in our case, um, with a very clear story about what we're doing and why it not only, you know, pertains to the commercial market, but how it pertains to the defence market, and, you know, most of the primes that are out to buy people, 
they, they more than slightly dabble in the defence world. So being able to understand the needs of the defence sector is hugely important, I think, as, a, as an SME in the, uh, uh, in the space sector these days. Yeah, and I think I, I, mean, I would add to that that um, you know, there, are, there are barriers to entry to working with the, uh, with the MOD. And um, as a small company, uh, okay, we are, we, we are still a relatively small company, but we do have that, the, 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 the backing of a large prime. But as a small company, there are, there are difficulties in, in overcoming those hurdles because you're not set up to do that. You're, you're not set up with the right uh, financial reporting that the MOD requires. You're not set up to deal with the contractual mechanisms that the MOD requires. Um, uh, okay, we were we were lucky, I suppose. You're not necessarily set up with the security requirements, or, or, although as, as it happens, we, we were we were closer on that one. But there are a number of things that you need to have in place in order to be able to to do business with the MOD. Uh, and as a small company, it's you know that's an undertaking. It's quite an undertaking to to go through to get to get that. Uh, as well, when you then take into account that it m may take some time to do all of that. Uh, that it ends up being, you know, a quite a, a chunky upfront investment on the uh, on the hope, I suppose, that this might come to some uh, fruition down the line. Just, just to add, to that, I mean, it, it actually, we're we're a, an SME that's not been acquired by Prime. <laughs> so perhaps to give a, a, a counter perspective mm -hmm. to these. Uh, Apologists for, for, for the process. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, as a venture capital-backed business, our, our investors do look for an exit. Um, uh, now, our strategy is, is, is to really focus on, on a, a, a niche product, which is uh, not easy for other people to replicate or for a prime to want to do, because it's much easier to outsource to us, because we, you know, well, they know what they're doing, but we know what we're doing particularly well. Uh, and, and therefore, we work with a range of prime contractors around the world, uh, and, and we're agnostic. You know, they're all our friends. I hope they are. Um, I'm just looking for any enemies in the room. No, they're all our friends. So, so that's what we try to do. Now, the problem is, the more successful we are in doing that, the more valuable we'll be to a prime contractor. Uh, so and, and so it's, a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, you could go down an independent furrow where we're a specialist provider to everybody, but then that just makes us, you know, something that can give a prime contractor a real cutting edge. So they'll probably bid up, bid up to uh, acquire us at some stage. I hope it's not too soon. <laughs> We're enjoying it in the meantime. We're getting very close to the end of our time. A um, bit of a wrap-up question, I suppose. What are you most excited about for the future between yourselves working in partnership with Defence? Um, just the the range and the breadth of the opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, they're now, you know, it's just fantastic, you know, having been in the space sector for the best part of 30 years, to see the MOD and defence having such a, a vision now that we can latch onto and go with them on is just tremendous. You know, we I, I didn't see this 10 years ago, didn't see it really five years ago, and it's just, the, you know, it's just been absolutely brilliant. So, I, you know, I really commend them. If we'd been having this discussion five years ago, I would have sighed and made something up and right. tried to be polite to the audience about how wonderful it was. But actually, you know, I can say this hand on heart now. It's, it's a great time to be working in the defence space. I mean, I suppose, just to echo that, you know, we, we heard from Michael Callahan, you know, getting uh, orders for nine satellites into space with varying sort of capabilities. Uh, and, and I'm sure that if we do our job correctly and prove the worth of these capabilities, these satellites for the border mission, as Harv said, it's not about the, the space, it's about what it's doing for, for, for us in defence or, or our border national interests. So, and I'm sure once we do prove that, there'll be so many other use cases that we'll see. So it's, it's all, you know, I can see we're at the start of inflection, if you like. Andrew? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm going to uh, say a similar thing, really, in that it's great to see that the ambition is there, um, because that is an ambition that, that, you know, that hasn't always been there. Um, I, I think I would challenge slightly what, what Alex said earlier, in that we do have a, a strong capability in the UK particularly in building small satellites, you know, in, in what we're doing, and, 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 and Doug, and AC Clyde, and others. The, uh, and, and that ambition gives that an opportunity 
to really come uh, come to the fore because you know we are we do have a world leading capability. Uh, a lot of that world leading capability has been used uh, in export situations uh, up until now. But but really now here with the ambition, we have the opportunity to to use that world leading capability to f for the good of the country uh, and to really m ensure that the UK can be positioned on a global stage in, in the way that it, it, it does have the capability to, to, to be. Colin. Uh, the one that I'm really excited about is the the work that's now going into SDA, Space Domain Awareness. I mean, the, the work that the guys with do at Filingdales is always, I've always found that absolutely gobsmacking what they're able to do with the, the equipment there. What it doesn't do is it doesn't image what's up there and that's what we are working towards. And I think that's an enormous, uh, enormous opportunity and it, it's gonna take significant funding to get there, but it, it really, that's the thing that really excites me at the moment. Ed, from your perspective? Um, I think it's opportunities on both sides and, yep. and partnership. Uh, I think we're at a, a really good point, uh, a stepping off point at the moment. I think how we may look at careers in the future mm -hmm. uh, and the potential to zigzag between you know, the, the private and, uh, and, and coming into uh, to military service, uh, certainly from an educational perspective, where we'll go with the academy and how we'll learn from, from what, uh, what's being delivered externally. Um, so I think you know, we're just at, you know, at that, that kick-off point now to, uh, to really work together. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're pretty much on time. I just want to, to wrap up and, and reflect for maybe a minute or two, if that's OK. Um, I've been madly scribbling some notes down, and there are a number of words that have been repeated quite a lot. Communication is, is key from both sides of the coin, I think, is fair to say. Um, and it seems from our academic and industrial panelists that they believe that MOD is getting better at doing that. We're getting better at communicating. We're being more open about it. Um, we're helping people understand better how they can pivot from other sectors into space, but also how people who are already working in space can better work with MOD. There's a recognition that we need to fail fast. That's been um, stated by several of the speakers um, over the last day and a half so far. So recognising that there's not a problem with failing and taking those lessons that we've learned forward for the future. And then I think the other key word that came up for me was collaboration. The importance of collaboration between defence, academia and industry, but amongst maybe industrial partners amongst academia working with industry as well. At that point, it's pretty much spot on 12 o'clock. So may I ask you to please thank the panel for their time today and their very illuminating answers to the questions. Thank you.